Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Raif Darazi, and today I have a very special guest, and we are going to be talking about the HOPE Collaboratory, as well as some other things related to HIV. She is a friend of mine. She's someone that I work with also in the HOPE Cab. Her name is Patricia de Fischero. Did I pronounce that yeah. correctly? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. yeah. I've been practicing. Thanks. <laughs> I know it's um, a hard one. <laughs> Well, th thank you so much for being willing to sit down with me and talk. I, I know you're extremely busy, so I appreciate it. It's a delight, Raif. Uh, I, I, I'm, I feel very grateful and blessed that Hope brought us together. I enjoy the interactions that I've had with you, and I have so much admiration for the work that you're doing um, through your social media, your advocacy, and the way you've picked up the baton as our HOPE uh, Community Advisory Board co-chair, and the group of people we are working with is amazing. Very blessed. So I've explained it before, but in your words, can you explain what exactly the HOPE Collaboratory is for folks that aren't aware? Well, the, the HOPE stands for HIV Obstruction by Program Epigenetics, and it's a very complicated mouthful, but it's basically a developing a new approach to eradicating, curing HIV. And a collaboratory is because the NIH has been funding a number of groups of researchers, uh, each group dedicated to developing approaches to curing HIV. So there's 10 of them. And the HOPE Collaboratory is focusing on an approach that you may have discussed before, which is called block, lock, and excise, where basically what we're trying to do with HIV, as you know, who remains hidden in the cells of people who are living with the virus, is a way to blocking it so it cannot multiply and create the havoc that it creates in our bodies, right? And once we block it, we want to lock it in place so it cannot come out again and uh, multiply and destroy the T cells or other, you know, um, cells of the immune systems and possibly excise it at some point. That excise meaning cutting it out, removing it, or cutting it in some ways, just the HIV DNA, which is the material of the virus, which is hiding in our cells, that it cannot do anything anymore. And it'll just remain there like a remnant of a former self, if you wish, with no harms, hope, you know, no harm to the people who are living with with the virus. That's a when yeah. you say lock the virus in 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 its container in the body, isn't that what the medicine does already? What's like what's the real difference there? Well that the antiretroviral therapy, what happens with that is that, yes, it locks the virus in place and it suppresses the replication. I don't want to use complicated term, but, pe you know, people may understand that a virus, when it, you get infected with a virus, you have the virus goes in your cells and it hijacks your cells and uses all the machinery to multiply. Mm -hmm. What the antiretroviral therapy does, it's like it stops the virus in its track and it cannot multiply. But if you remove and you don't take your medicine, then the virus may wake up again from where it is and start multiplying again and causing, uh, you know, negative effect on the body. With the block lock excise and other cure approaches, the idea is that you intervene, but then you don't need to be taking your medicines every day uh, for the rest of life. I, I cannot speak for other, you know, specific cure approach because I don't know them all, mm -hmm. but lock, lock and excise, we're hoping that it would be a combination of methods to get to the state of block, lock and excise. And once you've done that, you know, you could be free of having taken a medicine every day and you would be, you know, uh, you know, cured from, you know, from HIV. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious how you got to where you're at. I mean, I think most, when we think about people in the HIV research field, we, we don't necessarily think about them as three-dimensional human beings who <laughs> have lived a whole life. They're just, oh, they're the, the white lab coats, right? So I'm I'm curious how, what got you into I'm I'm assuming you weren't a little girl and decided you wanted to go into 
um, HIV virology uh, research. So I'm curious, what point did that kind of become important in your life? And, and what did that transition look like? Well, you know, that's a really, thank you so much for asking this question, Raif, because I often think about my path in life and it, and it's true, we are not unidimensional, not ever bidimensional, even tridimensional, right? We have all these identities and society tends to kind of reduce people to only one and that creates a lot of problems in society. And distrust. I, distrust and reductionism and discrimination, mm -hmm. I mean, Yep. the whole gamut um i grew up in a, a, i didn't have an easy childhood but i grew up in a in and that's shaped who i am today but i grew up in a family of artists both my parents um oh raif i can't see you anymore oh there you are i was, I was, I was <laughs> highlighting you <laughs> oh you scared me see that shows you how no, well, I didn't grow up in a family of computer techs and, and social media specialists. I'll oh. stay on the screen with you. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Um, I, my parents were both artists and they were not tech savvy. You know, my mom is a ballerina and my dad was a stage manager for the opera. So I grew up on the backstage of a theater and that was always part of of my identity yeah. being growing up. And my mom said, you could be anything, you could be anything, but don't be a dancer because she was a ballerina. It was a very, very tough life. And from a very early age, I was just passionate about nature, biology, animals. And I wanted to do something that was aching to that field. And somehow I started biology. I wanted to be a vet. I wanted to raise horses, but my parents kind of said, you know, I don't, I think it'll be too hard for you. And somehow I went into the biology, but very interestingly, Raif, from a very early age, when I was in college, uh, there was a drive that I wanted to go to virology. And mm. um, there was this, me wrong. it was really bizarre it's like i i started my studies and it was somehow wow. i knew i would it was going to be viruses and when i was wow. in my third year of college um i just really got you know mesmerized by um bernard rentier who was the uh one of our um virology immunology teacher and he had a lab and i was like oh that's where i want to go and I want to do my thesis when you, you do four years of college, the last year of your college, that was in Belgium, in Liège, you have to do a memoir, as we call it. And I really wanted to be on viruses. And when I, I got accepted in that lab, um, I started working on herpes viruses and mm. I was really passionate about it. And I did my PhD and then somehow in my head, somehow, HIV, and I was like, I knew I wanted to work. And it was mostly driven by the disparities and the fact that um, it was associated with so much um, human component, I guess, you and would so say. Was this, was this during the AIDS epidemic when it was? R yes, it was, it was in. Yeah, I I, uh, I moved to the U.S. in '98 to do my postdoc, and I started, you know, wanting. I met the the person I followed to the U.S., Eric Verdun, at that time, uh, when I was, you know, '96, '97. Yeah, so you know, it was very early on with new meds that were, but the the discrimination, the the upheaval. I mean, those those days it was pretty intense, and I was so devastated to see all that was happening in Africa. And that's mm. really what drove me. I mm. was collecting all the clippings of, uh, and I, I just wanted to to be involved and, and um, do my little part, I guess. Yeah. It was not an easy journey, I can tell you that. It was not, but that's it's how so I ended up in San Francisco. Sorry. It's so interesting that how, how your path went, being coming from such a creative background in the arts, did, do you find that there was exposure there that you had as a child being backstage with different performers of different backgrounds, ethnic, ethnicities? 
um, sexual orientations that kind of intersected with what you were seeing was happening with HIV? I, I There wasn't like a clear cut of oh, HIV and the people I grew up with, but I was blessed that my parents had a very uh, open, I guess, without, with, it was not like, you know, these days we talk about woke and there's all this thing going, you know, there was none of that, but my parents were just open hearted people, I guess. Mm -hmm. And my dad, his friends, uh, were gay. I mean, on the theater, I mean, we didn't even bat an eyelid. I mean, I didn't, you know, it was, uh, my mom, she would go and her, she danced her whole career. Most of her part partners, you know, uh, prim, she was a prima ballerina. She, uh, they, a lot of them were, were gay men and my, my grandparents in Ireland, the, the people would come over. I mean, I, I was lucky to have a family that was, um, really, uh, warm-hearted i guess yeah. in that respect and maybe that subconsciously has just made me the person that i am today that yeah. i you know take people at face value or with a label you know yeah i remember my only experience with someone with hiv who i assume had aids was in the early 90s my stepdad had a friend come over his name was randy and i think it was maybe the once or only two times that I ever saw him, he came over and he would look really gaunt and skinny and pale. And I remember um, my dad saying like not to hug him, to keep distance from him. And then I never saw him again. And, oh, and then God. as I got older, I kind of, I put two and two together of what that was. Oh, that was, that was a gay person. And that was a gay person who died from this disease. And that was my perception of the world. So it, it was like a very different, contrast from what you're telling me what you learned through osmosis through your parents this it really just makes me so sad because i've lost friends who are living with hiv and mm -hmm. um this 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 comment that you just made you know don't hug him right mm -hmm. i mean yeah. has human beings the power of touch I mean, even talking to you, I mean, my, I feel my skin, I'm getting like goosebumps all over in palliative care. A lot of the folks that people want that just to be held. Yeah. And once again, not everybody, some folks will say, oh, I won't, I don't want, but I think for a majority of people, just the power of touch skin is our biggest sensory organ and, mm. and, and what we've seen through the HIV epidemic where people were, were not even hug the care and we saw it again with COVID. I mean, to me, it's, yeah. It, to be I, robbed I feel of that it. in your most yes. vulnerable state. Vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And there was, yeah. and that's why education is so important. Like, you know, mm -hmm. how do, how are you exposed to the virus, yeah. this virus or any other virus or any other disease for that matter. But the stigma with HIV is so pervasive because it ties in with the whole societal attitude towards sex and sexual pleasure and intimacy right mm -hmm, which is mm -hmm. a huge taboo and yeah. you cannot engage in conversations around hiv may it be cure but you know most for prevention or even treat for anything without talking about you know pleasure and intimacy and the desire for connection you know mm -hmm. that people have and for pleasure and there's nothing wrong with that but oh my god you know sex Ooh. yeah and part of that separation exists has existed between healthcare and the community when it comes to hiv and so like you said that skin to skin contact i remember early on when after i was diagnosed a doctor who was wearing gloves took the effort to take off his glove and then touch me with touch my hand with his bare hand and i just remember being shocked like that was so profound for me that i still remember it now and how much that meant to me that like they weren't scared of me so and i yeah. feel like in some way hope the hope cab is doing that you know it's kind of we're taking the gloves off and saying let's hold hands and like do this together it's wonderful i i mean the hope uh leadership the scientists so you may have shared with your community audiences, you know, Suzanne Valente and uh, Melanie Ott and Lish, 
Plish and Lovo. Um, and, and that reflects to the entire collaboratory uh, as a whole, has really this desire to put the gloves down and work together, right? Because there's a really great support for, you know, the work that they're doing day in and day out. I mean, mm -hmm. you see them work. I mean, it's the hours, the long hours, the all the 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 incredible amount of effort to run these labs to find these scientific, you know, the nitty gritty of the scientific, um, and also this, you know, that when they're talking to me, you know, yeah, what, how can we support and you know. It's really amazing to to feel that support. It's really not lip service. There's really mm -hmm. a strong desire. And yeah, I think I, that, there, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say when I saw Melanie's uh, gummy bear earrings the first time when I met her, <laughs> I was like, okay, she's not the stereotype that I was thinking I was getting into. But that thing, right? The stereotypes, all those yeah. stereotypes that we have both on the on all of these fences or barriers that are be between people, right? Yeah. There's all these stereotypes. I mean, I always, I don't remember. It's like generalizations are the shortcut to discrimination. I know we put things into boxes because it helps our brain to kind mm -hmm. of engage in the world. Efficiently. Right. But at the same time, like people are so many different things and, yeah. and to have an open heart and an open mind to say, okay, well, maybe, you know, this gay person is not blah, 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 blah. Well, maybe this scientist is not blah, blah, blah. I think, mm -hmm. you know, that helps connect, yeah. you know, connect as, as human beings. Sure. On the, we have to, you know? Yeah. I feel like it all comes down to, um, what's comfortable and what's easy. And it's much easier to f put things into a duality, into a binary. And it's much easier to generalize and then and then that's it. You don't have to really put much effort into it. It's like you categorize things and there they are. But to be to look at someone and to constantly resist your urge to generalize takes constant effort. You have to constantly be consciously aware. And that isn't, that isn't to say that it's always difficult. It's just a muscle you have to practice. Um, and we all fall into that uh, trap, I think, of just stereotyping and generalizing. You just have to consciously be aware that we have the tendency to do that as human beings. I don't, I don't think it's an evil necessarily. I just think um, it's an unconscious thing that we do. And that's what you said exactly. It's being aware. Because I think once the awareness and the naming is being done, then there are ways to, um, you know, guide ourselves to re not with, with, not with self-blame, because that's another thing which leads to a lot of other issues, but to really guide oneself to, oh, maybe I'm going to see it different. That person mm -hmm. has a story behind them. There's a story for why they're here today doing this thing in front of me. And, um, and I think the more we have self-compassion towards ourselves, the more uh, we can be, you know, operating in the world in, in that way. And that infuses the work we do, Raif, you and I, you know, because there, it's the intention. I know Calvin, who's on our cab, always tells me, brings back to, what's your intention? And it's true. It's like, what is your intention in, mm -hmm. in, in, mm -hmm. in, in your interactions, in the work you're doing, and, um, and with self-compassion? Yeah. Well, we just went on a big tangent and I, I feel know. like, Sorry. <laughs> no, it's great. We could talk all day about many things. Um, but I know I we do. Have... We always do. We always do. I've been arraigning the horse a little bit here and I want to take it back a little bit mm. to some of the, your work that you've done in the past. I know that you were very involved with prep in the very early stages, possibly before it was even known as prep. Is that correct? Well, no, I think the the name pre-exposure prophylaxis was already being used, but okay. it's the it's with um, yes, I I, I had the uh, privilege, and it was not an easy road either at times, but the immense privilege to be uh, involved with the IPREX trial, um, Iniciativo Prophylaxis. I can remember even you know exactly what it says, but. Uh, which was the big trial with, which led to the approval by the FDA of mm. Truvada for uh, prevention. 
And um, IPREX was an extraordinary uh, study in as much that there was an enormous community involvement. And also we made, you know, mistakes on the route in terms of how, you know, a better job we could have done of, of uh, as a, you know, the whole prep field at the time to engage um, certain voices at the table. But the study in itself was just an extraordinary uh, for me from where I was in, in, the, in the core group that led the IPREX trial with Dr. Robert Grant and Vanessa McMahon and so many other incredible people was that we we really feel like we were so incredibly appreciative to our study participants. All the, uh, the folks who, I mean, they're superheroes, right? If folk, because at that time we, we did, you know, people didn't know was it going to be effective, not that, and the people that engaged in the clinical trials, you know, and gave their time and their specimens, and and um, yeah, I'm, I'm it was curious. A, yeah, I'm curious how that worked. So, I'm just trying to get into the mindset of someone at that time, as someone who was HIV negative, was signing up for this clinical trial and mm -hmm. trying a medication that obviously we, we're still figuring out whether it works. And so are these people knowingly exposing themselves to the virus? No, 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 how, no, no, no. How does that I mean, work? No, when you're doing the, those trials, first and foremost, the safeguards are in place. What you want is the well-being and the safety of your study participants. So people who were engaged in the trial were offered at every visit where they would come and give specimens and be giving their pills and whatnot, messaging about what to call it, safe, you know, safe practices. So it was, nobody was out there saying, oh, don't wear condoms, want to see if it works. What you want to see is that in addition to all of these safety practices that are being, behavioral practices that are being, uh, uh, encouraged and explained and whatnot is that if in the addition the people who were taking the pill because some were taking a placebo and some were taking the active mm -hmm. ingredient and we did the same with the injectable prep um, you know protocol you, do, you you're not saying people go and have you know on you know uncanny amounts of activities that would increase your likelihood of acquiring HIV. No, yeah. no, no, no. You have it in a me messaging, but within that con constraint, you have the pill or you have the placebo, you know, the active agent yeah. or the placebo. And that's why you need to enroll a large number of people because you want these variations to be statistically significant and not yeah. just be, you know, so. So they were essentially going about their lives as they would otherwise with the recommendation to can you continue safer sex practices yeah and then... and, and for, yeah and and sorry i just want to oh. add to that when you say going about their lives as, as usual and in in addition people were actually getting an increased amount of access to services because within the trial people would have sti testing at the visits access to other you know blood tests and some folks were having their health monitored really more then they, because of, you know, they would have had without being on the trial. So there was some benefits there in a way, but and I think it's still amazing that people, you know, engage and do it, you know? Do you, was it designed that way in order to encourage people to participate or was that a necessary part of the clinical trial structure? No, no, it's, it's not, there, there's no, you don't want to lure people by giving them incentive. So, that, you know, it, even the money that people get to participate in trials, it's because we want to compensate people for mm. their time and their effort, but it, it can't be and should not be anyways coercive, you know, that people, oh, you know, and it's the same, the stand, it's standard or care is because you want to make sure people are safe. And if you're taking a new pill that we might have some effects on your, you know, kidney function or your liver function, you want to make sure you follow people to the, you know, state of the art as best as possible. And the, the physicians on the trial were very, 
you know, very co cognizant of that. And that we have a lot of safety monitoring meetings where they're, you know, looking at all of these um, criteria in people's health. So yeah. It's almost like a fortunate byproduct of going through the clinical trial is that you happen to get monitoring in a way that you wouldn't otherwise in, in a form of healthcare that you wouldn't otherwise just like since I was diagnosed with HIV, I'm getting a blood panel every six months and and being able to look at my body in a way that I never have in, in the past. And it, that is to say, as it's not an encouragement to go get HIV because now you'll get blood work every six months, but it's, no. it's a fortunate byproduct of the fact that I had a diagnosis. And now I have yeah. very yeah. uh, in-depth care. In that, yeah, it, it's not it's not something that is done to entice people. It's just things that are being done because there are many layers of monitoring to ensure safety and yeah. and and um, accuracy from all of the data that's being collected. And I cannot speak for all of the clinical trials because I've just been involved in a few. But what I've witnessed firsthand uh, has been really thorough. So yeah. Well, it was obviously uh, a raging success because <laughs> here we are. Well, it took it took a while because at first there was a lot of pushback. I mean, I think there was some, mm. I mean, once again, I'm not going to speak for everybody, but when uh, just from where I stand, my, I'm not speaking for my team or for any other institution, but I feel once the results came out, and then there were other stored studies that were looking at PrEP as well, partners PrEP, you know, we were not the only one. Right. And um, there were a lot of pushback, which were linked to slut shaming and to the whole concept that people who were choosing to go on PrEP after FDA made it public, you know, it, 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 it was like, oh, people are going to have, you know, are going to go and have a lot of wild sex and, you know, kind of, and, and, and even so, like if people wanted to go and have a lot of sex, that's their prerogative. Maybe, you know, I'm not judging the behavior per se, but there was a lot of that idea going around where some people were saying, oh, I'm doing what I can to protect myself and my not acquire HIV and also protect my potential partners and, yeah. and stuff like that. So it took a while. There was a lot of pushback until some, um, you know, there was a tipping point. We reached kind of a, 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 at one point there was like, and I think if you could have Bob on the, on the, on your channel, he can talk to you um, about that in, in great detail where folks, um, you know, it, it, people realize, okay, this is, yeah, this is going to shift, you know, the course of prevention. And I and assume it, 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 it wasn't just the science community that was pushing for this change. I'm assuming community oh, yeah. had to be involved and in, in, I, I, I don't know where all the resistance was coming from, but. Um, well, before, you know, before, I think, uh, before the trials, I think people were already using maybe, intuit, you know, off-label kind of uh. doing kind of community was, I mean, there was the history of that. I don't remember the details and I'm not, you know, sure of all the, when it all kind of began. And I, once again, I think Bob would be a great person or Vanessa to have on your show or on your channel to discuss this, but community yeah, members were, yeah, community members were really talking about, you know, this, we want something else to protect ourselves. And we, we Truvada, I mean, it didn't just came out of nowhere. Community was very, once again, was very aware, had a lot of expertise and kind of, you know, was talking as well as long uh, in parallel as the science was happening, where they were showing in, in models that PrEP was efficient, you know, could do, you know, uh, this uh, preventive effect, you know, in the scientific lab experiments in the animal models, community members were saying, hey, so it came, you know, I think it also kind of coalesced in that way. Mm. But I think when the, 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 when um, the results came out and FDA approved, I mean, I remember I even, I even have a, a t-shirt that some, I forgot his name. Some it was called prep whore because there was so much pro pushback and I, I don't know what or who 
kind of initiated this pushback, but mm -hmm. it did it did happen and it slowed down uptake. And then, mm -hmm. you know, there was probably a lack of, you know, campaign or or making it known. And but but now you see what prep has become. I mean, yeah. it's you know there's a conferences about it and and um, yeah. So it's really bizarre to put myself back in 2012 or 2011 yeah. and, and, and and when it was so yeah well i i just missed the boat on prep so to speak i remember i think it, that came out maybe a year after i was or at least that i was aware of it a year after my diagnosis um but i remember kind of a similar sentiment happening around u equals u this kind of slut shaming oh you equals you that means everyone is just going to go around and and have sex and not care and and then somehow that's going to lead to more transmission which seems like a catch-22 but it seems like each incremental point of of progress there's a sense of fear that the progress itself is going to lead to more harmful, dangerous activities that will exacerbate the epidemic. But on some sense, I I, I feel like there's some latent discriminate, discriminatory belief systems that are kind of pushing that narrative along the way, especially when it's legislative. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm listening and to what you just said about U equals U and the I wonder if it's the people's perception rather than looking at the positive outcome. Like you said, it's like the fear. I mean, with PrEP, it was like, oh, you're going to have a lot of drug resistant viruses that are going to be selected. I mean, mm -hmm. um, I mean, we even had a study which was surveillance. People who did acquire PrEP, why, uh, acquire HIV while on PrEP, there's a few, you know, there's been a few cases and they've been looked into in depth. But it's like something new and I guess who knows what subconsciously, you know, may happen before a whole, there's a whole sociological studies around that about what it takes for the adoption of a new, a new approach. And, yeah. um, and I feel like the, the desire that people have had to take care and have another tool to take care of their own health and to have that option, you know, it's like, it's client centered, it's patient centered. It's like, here we are, nobody's being forced to, you know, into taking something, but it, what works best for you? You know, nobody, we're not going to force anyone to go take a prep or whatever. It's like, what, what in the toolbox of things can we give people so that they can make the best you know, choice and educate yeah. so that people have an opportunity to choose what may work for them. And Without the education, it's like, if people don't even know it exists, and that's why PrEP has been so, uh, I mean, there's been lagging in, 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 in the, you know, in, in the outreach in, 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 in different communities. And I'm, I'm thinking about, oh, Jim, oh God, his name, escapes me this this is the problem with being so tired um there was an amazing campaign spread love not with around prep um and it's jim i this last name escapes me he's gonna hit me for this but um he in, in chicago aids institute and he did this incredible campaign spread love which was really trying to go against the stigma. pardon Jim Ed Norman? No, 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 no. Um, sweet, oh, I, like I lost you now. Chicago Institute? The the AIDS, uh, uh, Chicago Hell AIDS. Um, I'm trying to look it up really quick. Yeah, yeah, look. Chicago AIDS. Um, Jim Spread Love. Yeah, Spread Love, Spread Tingle. Jim Pickett? Yes, yes, Jim Pickett. Yes, 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 Jim. Sorry, Jim. <laughs> He's amazing. He's amazing. He's such a wonderful advocate, you know, person. But he did this whole campaign with images on the buses about people being in an embrace. And 
it was all about spreading love and and tingles and joy then and to try to go against this whole slut shaming yeah jim so... pickett yes jim yeah i'd see how advocates do incredible work all around mm -hmm. okay well so back to the hope cab mm -hmm. what are your what are your hopes for i know this is the first year that we have formed our cab there's more around around the nation but ours is this is the first year um we for those of you that aren't aware we we are following the hiv cure research so with that in mind and with connecting scientists and researchers with community what are you hoping to achieve maybe for you personally or for our cab specifically moving forward uh well, the first and foremost is really the cab is a bridge, is a connector, right? You all are opening and getting into the world of the basic research of what's happening to find a cure for HIV, not just for block lock excise, but at the annual meeting, you can go and see or connect with all these other researchers and cab members. And is really, we want people to be excited, to not forget that HIV is there, and we need to find a cure for people who've been living with HIV for a long time, for the new folks who unfortunately didn't get the PrEP or, you know, acquire the virus. And education, right, be able to have access to that information, to have also an honest opinion on that cure research that's being done. What would work best for communities? What communities' concerns are? That's really what I, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting most and foremost for our Hope Collaboratory and for the CAB is this bi-directional conversation between all the community folks that are, you know, involved, our mm -hmm. community partner, you know, at the foundation and the scientists, you know, seeing scientists engage in their work, thinking about, oh, I, mean, I never thought about these psychosocial component. You know, I'm doing the experiments, but yes, this is a person living with HIV who's got a deal with X, Y, and Z. And we have these conversations be beneficial for both, you know, partners, right? It's, it's an equal partnership of conversation, of connection, you know, giving opportunities for CAP members to discover new things, you know, learn skills, you know, bring their expertise to the scientist. Uh, and for me uh, personally, yeah, I'm gonna really see people thrive, you know, people be, you know, enjoy the work that they're doing and feeling that um, we're part of a good group and, and that we're connecting with one another. Yeah, that's really important. I, nothing makes me more happy when you say to me, oh, you know, I'm gonna interview um, Michael, you know, from the dare cap, you know, this all, all of us really working together. Yeah. And bringing in the arts with Pauline and the, the care yeah. program. I mean, Which that's reminds me, I need to amazing. schedule that with him. Well, I'm waiting for the language document to be finalized, but yeah, that'll happen. I, I'm scheduling a lot of interviews this year and it's, it's intimidating. It's a little scary, but um, I'm really excited at the same time. Yeah, no, I get it. Um, okay. So at, in closing, we've, been about 45 minutes. I appreciate you, you know, taking all this time to chat with me. I I think I want to start asking a question that I'm going to ask everybody to kind of get to gauge how they view this. But I want first, I would like to ask you what you would like to share, communicate with people watching that maybe you feel you haven't been able to express yet. And then secondly, what is your assessment of the global state of the HIV epidemic, you can, and however you want to interpret that. Um, something I haven't had a chance to uh, want people. Um, or just anything you would like to say to the viewers. But I, I think to me, it really, I think it comes back to the essence of who I am and how I engage in this work. People might see me as a scientist and may think I have ulterior mo motives or, you know, whatever, you know, how I present to the world by my ethnicity, my identity, you know, to, to, to viewers. 
but really the core of who I am is really that I care. I really deeply care uh, about us taking care of each other and of the planet. And that's how I engage in this work. And that if the people who listen to this show um, can, you know, engage on this path of whatever they're doing into the world with the sense of connectedness with each other and um, that we may have all our cultural or identities and but we're all really connected to one another and we really are connected to the, the you know the planet we live on and that it's all part of of um the work that we do with hiv and it's connected to so many other things yeah i think i think for me it's that sense of uh the purpose of the work mm -hmm. that i'm doing it's not for personal uh, achievement per se. Yeah. And in, in my experience state... with you, that comes across very, very loud and clear. <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> and, um, and, you know, I have other dreams and things I want to do with healing and whatnot. So, um, and in the state of the HIV epidemic, well, I it's still a huge issue. I mean, there's so many people, even though we have PrEP, like you say, you you missed the boat on PrEP. To me, nothing breaks my heart more is to hear a young person, or it doesn't have to be a young person, but somebody tell me, you know, I didn't know PrEP or I didn't have access and, and then acquire a virus, which if it's not a death sentence today, the way it was back in the, you know, when you know it all started, it's still, you know, it has an impact on your body and you have to take meds every day. And if you don't take them, who knows what might, might happen. And even if you take the meds, you're still inflammation going on in your body. And for uh, us living in the Western world, we, we have access to uh, a lot of, you know, medicines and, and things like that. But so many parts of the world where people don't, or if they do, there's uh, laws or or, or, or situations that prevent people from having access to some of the things we, we have here. On the other hand, we have here a lot of things that are also not very helpful, but that's another story. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, Patricia, for engaging in this conversation with me. I encourage everyone watching, if you have comments or questions, please leave them below, whatever platform you are watching this on, and maybe. I can have you back at some time and we can follow up and maybe answer some questions and, and take it from oh, there. Oh, I'd be happy to. I'd be, I'd be happy to talk to your audience. I'd be happy to talk at the use of the arts. There's so many people I didn't mention today that I would call attention to, to the work they do. Um, yeah, thanks, you, Raif. It's just, and I'm not a social media person or <laughs> I'm not very familiar with being on, on the TV, on the screen and whatnot. So, yeah. That's what I'm here Give for. Give me for that. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. All right. Thanks, everyone. Please like this video. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't. Share this with anyone who you think might find this helpful. Liking and subscribing are the number one ways in which you can support my channel, encourage it to grow, and help me to continue doing what I'm doing to provide you this valuable content. All right, everyone. We'll see you next time. Cheers. Bye.